Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, When to Fire Your VM Provider. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Event Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm excited to be a part of the event today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentations will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you are not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you are experiencing technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It is the question mark icon on your console and covers common te technical issues. If you have a question during the presentation, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. Our speakers will reply to you via email. For attending today, you may download our new VM Buyer's Guide. Click on the Resources widget at the bottom of your console. You will also be able to download the slide deck from today's presentation via that widget. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast. So now let's get on with the presentation. Our speakers today are David Pinkard, Senior Product Manager, VM at Tripwire, and Andrew Sabota, Senior Security Researcher at Tripwire. So now, without further delay, I'm going to turn it over to David Pinkard. Take it away, David. Thank you, Kate. I'm David Pinkard, and I'm with Tripwire in the Product Management Group. I'll be spending some time with you today talking about vulnerability management. Let's start with a baseline understanding or context. Uh, enterprises are faced with growing complexity. The organization keeps adding more and more different types of devices to their environment, adding to the complexity that we all have to deal with. And environments are expanding. More and more assets are being added every day. At the same time, resources are shrinking, and we all are being asked to do more with less. With these shrinking resources and being asked to do more with less, it's important to know when it's time to get a new VM provider. So when is it time? It's time to get a new VM provider when they haven't kept up with the tech you need in the cloud, for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, or they're not providing you with the deep risk assessment you need to understand your environment or you're experiencing patch frustration. Ah! <laughs> You've got a 1,000 CVSS 10s. You're chasing false positives. How do you prioritize your remediation resources? It's all very challenging and frustrating. So let's take a look at each area in depth. Cloud brings a number of new elements into the equation. So let's take a look at them. Organizations continue to be attracted by the financial and technological benefits of cloud computing. And there has been some significant acceleration and adoption of this computing platform over the last few years. And with cloud comes multiple cloud providers, more virtual machines, and containers. Most of you are familiar with the different cloud providers and virtual machines, but may be newly exposed to containers. So let me give you a brief container overview. Containers are lightweight, self-contained virtual images designed to execute specific tasks or applications repeatedly and reliably and are often switched from non-running to running or vice versa as they are needed. It's important to scan containers for vulnerabilities no matter where they are running or what state they are in, and to do so regularly because they can be updated often and even in production. However, assets and data deployed in the cloud are not secure by default. The shared responsibility model clearly articulated by cloud vendors means that while the cloud provider will take responsibility for the cloud infrastructure itself, customers are responsible for the security of their own applications. 
So customers are responsible for the security of their own applications and data. Your on-premise assets are not likely going away, so you'll need a solution that works on-premise and in the cloud. In fact, you'll most likely need a solution that supports multi-cloud environments with your on-premise deployment. So what you really need is a solution built for a hybrid environment. Cloud introduces new configurations and use cases. As I mentioned, you want a solution built specifically for a hybrid environment because you may need to deploy a console and or scanners in the cloud or connect to scanners or consoles in multiple cloud platforms in conjunction with your on-premise deployment. Generally, you can't have a scan engine scanning from one cloud into another cloud. Since scanners generate a lot of outbound traffic that can look like an attack when it's transmitted from one cloud environment to another. With technology designed for multi-cloud environments, scanners can collect the data and route it back to your vulnerability console wherever it's located. Also, in some cases, you may want the ability to build an agent directly into your VMs in your cloud environment. Remote scanning isn't always an option for images and cloud providers. So you need the ability to build an agent directly into your images for AWS, Azure, Google Cloud Platforms to scan for the vulnerabilities and collect that information and feed it back to your console. Cloud assets are often very dynamic by nature and change frequently. In some organizations, they can be attacked before the organization even realizes the cloud asset exists. So you'll want the ability to seamlessly support the dynamic nature of cloud assets. As cloud assets spin up, you'll want the ability to detect it as it comes online and immediately perform a vulnerability scan. One straightforward way to achieve this is to build vulnerability agents directly into the images. It's probably even more important to have the ability to detect when an actionable change occurs in a cloud asset and automatically initiate a vulnerability scan on the asset to determine if new vulnerabilities have been introduced by the change. So basically a scan on change capability. This ensures that you assess the vulnerability impact of system changes immediately when they occur and reduces the requirement for frequent scans on your cloud assets. As cloud usage has grown, so has the popularity of containers. Containers are now being used by over 10,000 organizations, and many of them are not aware of the vulnerability exposure they have. Some critical container functionality to have are, you need the ability to scan online, offline, and non-running containers for vulnerabilities, giving you an enhanced overall view and lowering the chance the vulnerabilities will slip through the cracks during the development stage and into production. This will offer stronger security for DevOps processes, whether on-premise or in the cloud. And perhaps even more important is the ability to detect and scan containers because many organizations don't pause their containers, but instead blow them away and spin them up the next time they need them. So in many cases, a pause container is an error. It's also important to have the ability to build security into your DevOps process, your continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline. Pre-deployment assessments are key. Finding vulnerabilities and configuration deviations early when they're the easiest to fix before they've been pushed into production. So finally, enterprise IT security executives are responsible for actively and continuously reducing security risk in their businesses, which means assessing all of the components on their network for vulnerabilities. Containers are no exception. So it's important for you to have a thorough vulnerability assessment tools for containers as well. Now let's take a look at deep risk assessment. You'll need an enterprise vulnerability management solution that provides deep risk assessment. 
One that automatically discovers all the endpoints in your environment and profiles each endpoint using high-quality checks from a world-class research team and applies advanced vulnerability scoring to highlight the greatest risks in your environment, utilizes scalable on-prem architecture design for performance integration and ease of management, and can be reconfigured and scaled to support cloud or your hybrid environment, delivers actionable analytics and reporting to better manage risks across your corporate stakeholders, provides multi-tenancy for data segregation, data segregation capabilities for service providers and large enterprises, and offers unique integrations into your security ecosystem. Now I'd like to talk to you about various assessment methods. Assessment depth can significantly impact the accuracy of results. Deeper assessments gather more detailed information, which the system can use to improve accuracy. Let's look at different types of vulnerability assessment methods. Agent list discovery. Look for a solution with unlimited agent list discovery with comprehensive fingerprinting and application service detection to accurately identify and profile your assets. This allows you to inventory ports, services, and applications exposed on your network and to identify each type and operating system platform. Agentless credential scanning. Credential scans use administrative credentials to inspect file system, registry, and configuration files. Credential assessments take longer to run but the additional information gathered dramatically improves both discovery and assessment accuracy. Non-credentialed scans. Our assessments performed remotely without credentials providing the same view an outside attacker would have. Less information is garnered about the application footprint of the asset, but more data is available regarding the protocols and services that can communicate with the asset. In some cases, VM products rely on banner checks that can lead to inaccurate results. It's better to look for a solution that relies on direct condition tests. And finally, agent-based scanning. Agent-based scanning provides visibility into areas where traditional network scanning is not practical, such as environments with intermittently connected devices, you know, such as laptops dynamic IP addresses, cloud images that are spinning up and down, uh, and bypass the need to manage credentialed access. For the deepest VM risk assessment, you should be able to mix or combine agentless and agent-based scanning results. This will give you the deepest risk assessment of critical assets, well, you also want to be able to preserve the source of the, of the scan type and produce the vulnerability information. So basically, you want to be able to combine the external vulnerability information of an asset with the vulnerability information of an internal scan, bring those to give, together to give you a very rich view of the asset. And you want to be able to dig into the scan type that actually provided the particular vulnerability information. To avoid patch frustrations, a series of functions and resources need to be in place. So now let's take a look at those. You need a solution that is powered by an extensive database of vulnerability conditions, which is produced by a world-class vulnerability research team. I should note that you want the orientation of the team to be focused on accurate detection and assessment of your assets and their associated vulnerabilities. You don't want the majority of the team focused on research, discovering new vulnerabilities out in the wild, but more detecting the vulnerabilities inside of your organization. Vulnerability rules and data. 
people who want full access to them. And you want full visibility into the vulnerability rules so that you can see what is causing the detection of your vulnerabilities. And you want to be able to customize the rules or add your own. You also want full access to the instant data from the rules so that you can perform deep inspection on the data that was returned by the rules. You want a solution with low false positives. Any false positive is frustrating and consumes valuable time. If you get a solution that combines all of the functionality and resources that I've just covered, you should have a VM solution with low false positives. If I can boast for a moment, uh, Tripwire's IP360's false positive rate is only 0.04%, which is impressive. Detailed risk scoring. Every organization is different, with different priorities, risk tolerance, and threats to combat. Industry standard vulnerability scoring systems, such as CVSS, may rate a vulnerability as a 10 on a scale of 1 to 10. But for your specific organization, the same, may, the same threat may represent a higher or lower risk. CVSS is a good baseline scoring option that allows you to compare vulnerabilities across products. Risk scoring is a good example of how customization can help your organizations tailor VM data to a specific business requirement. Many VM systems offer a high, medium, low, or zero to 10 scores. In organizations with thousands or tens of thousands of vulnerabilities, these rough scores lose meaning. Advanced VM solutions should provide flexible, granular, granular scoring systems that can be adapted to even the largest networks. I believe examples are always very helpful. So let's look at Tripwire's IP360's advanced vulnerability scoring. And this will hopefully explain what I was just talking about. Tripwire is rather unique in terms of what it provides for vulnerability scoring. Of course, we provide CVSS scores, but we also produce a risk score based on three criteria. The likelihood of an attack or how easy the attack is. The impact of the attack or how much damage an attacker could inflict. And time, meaning how long has the vulnerability been known to the security community. And what it produces is a score from effectively zero to infinity because of the time component. So the longer a vulnerability is known, the higher the score goes. And that gives you the ability to make a decision about how to deploy your, your remediation efforts on a very granular basis. You may have a 1,000 vulnerabilities that are at a score of 10 for CEVSS. And you find yourself trying to answer which 10 is the most 10. So this scoring system allows you to determine out of all of these terrible vulnerabilities, this one is really the worst. One example of the representation of these scores that is popular is the risk matrix or heat map, where we remove the time component and plot the vulnerability on this matrix. So you can see in the upper right-hand corner you have 56 vulnerabilities that provide remote privilege access and have an automated exploit. And those are the first 56 vulnerabilities that you are going to want to address first because they represent the highest risk. Of course, we have other reports to help you take action based on the data that you've collected during your vulnerability assessments. Thank you. If you have any questions for me, please leave them in the Q&A. And now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Andrew. Hello. My name is Andrew Savota. I work on VERT as a security researcher. I'll be talking about some high-profile vulnerabilities and how the IP360 can help. The Blinkenbacher Oracle vulnerability, or robot, is the return of a 19-year-old vulnerability. 
This vulnerability allows RSA decryption and signing operations with the server's private key. This means that the confidentiality of TLS is broken when RSA encryption is enabled. The vulnerability exists because of errors in the padding of the public key cryptography standards, PKCS versions 1.5. The errors in the padding allow an adaptive chosen ciphertext attack. This vulnerability affects many products that have TLS enabled. Companies such as F5, Citrix, and Cisco are examples of some companies that have had their products affected. The IP360 has detection of the weak and strong forms of the Lückenbacher Oracle vulnerability. The weak form of the Oracle vulnerability is much harder to exploit because it requires an impractical number of Oracle queries, while the strong version of the Blickenbacher Oracle is much more readily exploitable. The IP360 remote detection is based off of a direct condition test for any service running TLS. Meltdown was another high profile vulnerability that affected systems with microprocessors utilizing speculative execution and indirect branch prediction. The vulnerability exposes an unauthorized disclosure of information However, to exploit the vulnerability, an attacker would require local user access to the system. Meltdown affects both Windows systems and Linux distributions. Microsoft and most Linux distributions have already released patches for this vulnerability. The IP360 has local authenticated detection for both Windows and Linux distributions. The detection on Windows systems is based on vulnerable file version information and registry keys. The detection on Linux distributions is based on vendor information about vulnerable packages in the particular distribution. Around the same time as Meltdown, Spectre was released. Spectre affects systems with microprocessors utilizing speculative execution. There are two different forms of Spectre, CV2017 5753, which affects microprocessors utilizing speculative execution and branch predictions, while CV2017-5715 affects microprocessors utilizing speculative execution and indirect branch predictions. Both of these vulnerabilities require an attacker to have local, uh, local user access via a side channel analysis. Spectre affects both Windows systems and Linux distributions. Microsoft and most Linux distributions have released patches to fix this vulnerability. The IP360 has local authenticated detection for both Windows and Linux distributions. The detection on Windows systems is based on vulnerable file version information and registry keys, while the detection on Linux distributions is based on vendor information about vulnerable packages in their particular distribution. Apache Stress was affected by a code execution vulnerability, CV 2018-11776. Apache Struts was affected when the always select full namespace was set to true. This vulnerability allowed the injection of custom OGNL statements by creating a crafted namespace. This vulnerability allowed an attacker to execute commands in the context of the web server. Multiple versions of Apache Struts were vulnerable the versions of Apache Struts that were vulnerable range from 2.3 to 2.3.24 and 2.5 to 2.5.16. The IP360 has a remote condition test and a local authenticated test to determine if Apache Struts is vulnerable. The remote condition test is a direct test for the vulnerability while the local authenticated detection is based on vulnerable versions of Apache struts installed on the system. Oracle WebLogic was vulnerable to a Java deserialization vulnerability. CVE 2018-26-28 because of an incomplete patch for CVE 2015-4852. This vulnerability exists because Oracle did not actually patch the vulnerability but blacklisted accessible packages. Just like the original patch, the new patch does the same. The packages that were blacklisted in this patch were org.apache.commons.collections.functors, com.sun.org.apache.xlin.internal.sun.org.apache.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.xlin.x
xsltc.tracks and Java Assist. This vulnerability affected multiple versions of WebLogic, 10.3.6.0, 12 12.1.3.0, 12.2.1.2, 12.2.1.3. The IP360 has remote detection determined if a system is affected by this vulnerability. The remote detection is a direct condition test to see if the vulnerability is present on the system. Another vulnerability that Oracle WebLogic was affected by was CVE 2018-2935 due to a security vulnerability in the JSF subcomponent. Successful attacks using this vulnerability would give access to critical data or complete access to all of the data accessible in WebLogic. To exploit this vulnerability, an attacker would require another human to interact with. The versions of Oracle WebLogic that were affected are 10.3.6.0, 12.1.3.0, 12.2.1.2, and 12.2.1.3. The IP360 has the ability to detect Oracle WebLogic versions installed on a system to help mitigate this vulnerability. Code SSP was affected by a code execution vulnerability, CVE 2018-0886. This one really allowed an attacker to relay user credentials to execute code on a target system. Since the vulnerability was released, a proof of concept was uh, put on exploit DB. This one really affected any Windows systems that had CRUD SSP enabled. The IP360 has local authenticated detection for Windows systems. The detection on Windows systems is based around vulnerable file version information and registry keys. Lazy floating point unit context switching vulnerability, CVE 2018-3665 is a speculative side channel attack. This vulnerability affects the Intel processor. Both Windows and Linux distributions were affected by this vulnerability. Microsoft and most Linux distributions have released a patch to mitigate this vulnerability. The IP360 has local detection for both Windows and Linux systems. The detection for Windows works by determining the CPU manufacturer and vulnerable file version information. The detection for Linux distributions determines if there are any unsafe boot parameters enabled. The Intel Software Guard extensions, SGX, contain a privilege escalation vulnerability, CVE 2017-5736. This vulnerability allowed an attacker to execute code as an administrator. The vulnerability affects the Intel Software Guard Extensions platform component. The versions of the Intel Software Guard Extensions platform component that were affected were versions less than 1.9.105.42329. The IP360 has local authenticated detection to determine if a vulnerable version of the Intel Software Guard Extensions is installed on the system. Oracle Database was affected by CV 2018-2939. This vulnerability allowed an attacker to access all critical data or all core RD PMS accessible data and potentially cause the service to hang. This vulnerability required an attacker to have login privileges to exploit the vulnerability. The vulnerability affected Oracle Database versions 11.2.0.4, 12.1.0.2, and 12.2.0.1, and 18.1. The IP360 contains local authenticated coverage to determine if the installed database service is vulnerable. Oracle Database contained another vulnerability, CVE 2018-3004. This vulnerability allowed an attacker with low privileges to compromise the Java VM. Oracle database server versions that were affected are 11.2.0.4, 12.1.0.2, 12.2.0.1, and 18.2. The IP360 has local authenticated coverage to determine if a system with Oracle database is vulnerable. The last high-profile vulnerability I'll be talking about is for the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel was affected by CVE 2018-8781, which was an integer overflow. 
Attackers must have local access to the system with access to the UDLD RM FB driver. This vulnerability allowed an attacker to obtain full read and write permissions on the kernel physical pages. This vulnerability affected kernel versions from 3.4 to 4.15. The IP260 has local authenticated coverage to determine if a system is vulnerable. I'd like to thank our speakers today, David Pinkard and Andrew Swoboda. And thank you, our audience, for attending. We hope that you found the presentation informative and useful to you. I'll be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the on-demand version of the webcast. Also, if you'd like to receive proof of attendance for this webcast, please respond to the follow-up email. We hope that you'll join us for future webcasts. Check out our schedule at tripwire.com. Thank you, and have a great day.